Okay, well back to simple geometrical objects. Um, remember we did quite a bit with simple geometrical objects when we were working with gravitational fields. We're going to start off by looking at a couple um, simple geometrical configurations with magnetic fields, one of which we'll start with will be the monopole field. And of course you're saying, well there are no magnetic monopoles, uh, what are you talking about? But, you know, as we mentioned before, we could have a very long dipole. This could be well casing. We could be fairly close to the uh, top of the well casing. And uh, the uh, uh, base of the well casing could be at some significant distance, much, much, much larger than the uh, distance to the negative pole so that we have this relationship here. And uh, if we calculate the potential, we have the potential over the distance to the negative pole minus the potential, or the uh, pole strength over the uh, distance to the negative pole minus the pole strength over the distance to the positive pole. Uh, remember the field lines are coming upward from the uh, positive pole, and by definition those are negative, so we have a negative sign here. Uh, this term is negligible because R is so large, so we end up with a potential equal to P over R minus. And then we're taking the negative derivative of the potential. We get the magnetic field intensity of the pole. That would be equal to P over R minus squared. So we have an inverse square law, much like we did with, uh, we were working with gravitational fields. So now your observation point in the well, you know, may be off uh, at some, some arbitrary angle with respect to magnetic north. So you're likely going to have a component, um, uh, H sub P is going to be pointing off, not going to be pointing directly towards magnetic north, so you're going to have to project your, um, uh, you know, this, this value onto the uh, x-axis. Remember, x is the north-south, uh, magnetic north-south uh, axis. So, if there is this, uh, so we're dealing with this magnetic field intensity here. We want to get the uh, vertical, horizontal, x and y components. Uh, if there is a significant h sub y component, then we would have to calculate the projection of h sub p onto the x-axis in order to get the north-south component, which is going to to be the component that contributes to the um, to the anomalous field intensity. So we have f sub at is equal to z sub p times the sine of i, just using this equation that we developed earlier, uh, plus h sub p times the cosine of i times the cosine of alpha, if alpha is significant. Uh, otherwise, we can just calculate the uh, total field anomaly as f sub at is equal to z sub p times the sine of the inclination plus h sub p x if we include this, times the cosine of i. And uh, so we're going to pursue this development further, but we're going to do it using Cartesian coordinates. And it'll follow an approach outlined by Berger et al. I don't know which text you have access to, but you, you know, texts uh, do, do, do things a little bit differently, but, but I think you'll find similarity and you'll find similar explanations in, in just about any text, but we'll rewrite the potential as p over x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the one half. This is r, and uh, x squared plus z x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to r squared. So then we take the the negative derivative in the x and y directions. So if we take it um, in the x and z directions, so in the z direction, this is going to give us the vertical field intensity minus dv dz. And if we take the negative derivative of this term, we get that the vertical component of the field is equal to the pole strength times the depth z over x squared plus y squared plus z squared, or the 3 halves power. Now, remember, we, we earlier when we were looking at the hysteresis uh, loop and the magnetization, uh, the intensity of magnetization I is the magnetic dipole moment over the volume. So we have P times L over V, which gives us a P over A. That was equal to the susceptibility times the 
intensity of the magnetizing field. So we're just carrying the area over here. That would be the area of the well casing at the near the surface. So then we obtain the vertical component then is equal to K times uh, the Earth's magnetizing field strength. We assume that this is the field which is magnetizing the ob uh, object uh, times the cross-sectional area times Z over X squared plus Y squared plus E squared to the 3 halves power. And then we can do the same thing for uh, H sub PX. So we can rewrite Z sub P, uh, the vertical component here, associated with uh, uh, an anomalous field intensity pointing towards the uh, pole. And we, we, can, we can take out a Z over X squared plus Y squared plus E squared to the 1 half power. And this turns out just to be the sine of theta. And x squared plus y squared plus e squared is just r squared. So we have p over r squared times z over r is equal to p over r squared times the sine of theta, or just k f sub e a times z over r cubed. And likewise, we can do the same thing for h sub px. And you can program these, you know, in terms of their x, y, and z coordinates, you could program this in Excel to obtain the following relationships. So notice that for the monopole, the vertical field intensity across the anomaly is centered at zero. And it's also symmetrical. So the values to the south, this would be the south, this would be the north, should have put those in there. Uh, we end up with this symmetry here in the vertical component, the total field becomes slightly asymmetric because it's going to be the sum of the it's square root of the sum of the squares, uh, z sub a squared plus h sub a x squared. So it it develops a little bit of asymmetry, and then this is the horizontal component. Now it's negative because for the horizontal component we have a vector pointing to the south. That, by definition, is negative. And then for, you know, on the other side, we're pointing towards, we're pointing in the northward direction. So we have a positive. And so when we take the square root of the sum of the squares of these two terms, we get a slight dip to the, to the north here. And uh, so that's... Um, We'll talk a little bit more about the monopole field. We'll come back to that. Uh, but next time we're going to talk about the dipole field. Um, I'd, I'd say take some time, go back over those calculations, um, make sure you're comfortable with the development for the monopole field. And we've done the dipole field, but we did it for the case where the distance, the distances to the positive and the negative poles of the dipole were similar to the distance to the center of the dipole. In other words, we solved for the dipole field for the case when the dipole was located very far away. And now we're going to pull the dipole up into the near surface. It's going to be close to us. We're going to see the contribution, separate contributions from the negative and the positive poles. And we'll have to deal with this problem a little bit different. So we'll uh, hope you'll join us next time and uh, talk to you then.